I want to welcome everybody to uh, Maine Law's Constitution Day event as we celebrate the signing in 1787 of what is uh, the world's oldest written uh, constitution. Uh, it's a document that we all love and respect, but also one that we fiercely debate and disagree with uh, respect to its meaning. Uh, when I realized uh, earlier this year that Constitution Day would have to be online this year, I thought, uh, let's go big. Uh, let's try to land the most prominent, the most well-respected constitutional scholar in the country. Uh, now, this is not meant to be a, a slight or a dig in any of our previous speakers. We've had a lot of good ones. Uh, I hear the two professors we had last year were absolutely incredible. Uh, but I figured, uh, let's get a constitutional law expert that we might not otherwise be able to bring to Portland for a midweek uh, lunchtime talk. And my first thought was Pam Carlin. Uh, why Pam? Uh, I'm not gonna read you her bio. You're all in front of the computer right now. You can all Google her background. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few of my personal reasons. Uh, in baseball, scouts talk about five tool players, kind of this rare specimen who can do it all. Hit for average, hit for power, run well, throw well, field well. It's a rare player that actually has all five tools. Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, Mike Trout, uh, more modern example. Uh, Professor Carlin is the legal academia equivalent of those all-time greats. Uh, first, she's an incredible teacher. I came to law school thinking I was interested in science, technology, intellectual property, uh, and then I met Pam. And after taking a constitutional law class with her, I was hooked. Uh, I'm pretty sure I took a class with Pam every single semester after that, uh, voting rights, uh, constitutional litigation, a class that we lovingly refer to as the secret con law study group. I don't know more about that. I can, I can tell you later. Uh, second, she's a prolific and respected scholar. She has published extensively in many of the top law reviews around the country. She has written numerous influential books about the Constitution. She has authored numerous case books. Third, she is the epitome of what academic service looks like. She has served at the national level, at the state level, at the local level. She's one of the leaders of the American Constitution Society. She has served as a commissioner on the California Fair Political Practices Commission. Fourth, Pam is an incredible lawyer. In addition to her teaching at Stanford, she directs the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. She has argued or been actively involved with numerous oral arguments, including last year's Seminole Bostock case, uh, which held the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. Take a listen to her oral argument on YouTube or on the Supreme Court's website to hear what good oral advocacy really looks like. Uh, for most of us, being as prolific as Pam in any one of these four categories would be a terrific accomplishment. Uh, but to stick with the five tool analogy that I've committed myself to, uh, Pam is a wonderful person. She is deeply caring about her students. She is one of the funniest people I've ever met. I still remember many of the jokes from Con Law, even though it's been uh, nearly 20 years since I was in that class. So we're very grateful to have Pam here with us today, and I'm excited uh, to hear your talk. Pam will leave some time at the end for questions, so feel free to post some in the Q&A tab below, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Pam, take it away. Thanks so much. And Dimitri, you know, one of the hugest pleasures of my career is getting to see all the great work that my students go out and do. And, um, you know, you among them, it's just, it's just a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and for you to say such nice things about me in terms of baseball, which as you know, is my, is my favorite sport. Um, so constitutional law is often in the headlines. It may therefore seem a little strange that one of the most important things the Supreme Court ever wrote was in a footnote. And that footnote appeared in a case involving the earth-shaking question of whether Congress could forbid a corporation from shipping a container of milnut, which was a mixture of skim milk and coconut oil. I think it's kind of like the predecessor of almond milk and the like. Um, ship that container from Illinois to Indiana. In that famous footnote, called Footnote 4 of United States Against Caroline Products Company, uh, the Supreme Court explained that in general, when courts are asked to review legislation, they should uphold the legislation if the court can identify some rational basis for thinking the statute served some legitimate government purpose. There had to be only a very tenuous fit 
between what the statute did and, 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 and how it operated. But the court identified three categories of laws that shouldn't get this kind of deference, that should instead be subjected to what the court called more exacting judicial scrutiny. That is, cases where courts should be skeptical of the law. Two of those categories centered on defects in what the court called the political processes by which individuals and groups are normally expected to protect their interests. The first category of laws that the court said courts should give an extra special hard look to were those that restricted the political process itself. And here, not surprisingly, the court's prime example of the kind of law that courts should look carefully at were restrictions on the right to vote. The second category involved laws targeting what the court called discrete and insular minorities against whom prejudice was working to curtail the way that people normally protect themselves through ordinary politics. A generation later, the Supreme Court gave two teeth to Caroline Product's suggestion. Uh, in an opinion for the court in Kramer against Union Free School District, Chief Justice Warren explained that because the right to exercise the franchise in a free and unimpaired manner is preservative of other basic civil and political rights, any alleged infringement of the right of citizens to vote must be carefully and meticulously scrutinized. Thus, instead of applying deferential rationality review, where the court just asks, can we hypothesize uh, some legitimate purpose that this law, must, that, that this law serves, uh, courts faced with restrictions on the right to vote have to determine whether the exclusions are necessary to promote a compelling state interest. So the idea here is that the interest the state is pursuing has to be a specially weighty interest, and the law has to really serve that interest. It's not just enough to see some connection, there has to be a tight connection. And even today, after a series of decisions that have moved towards what the court sometimes calls a more flexible approach to some regulations of elections, uh, regulations like the time uh, or the use of absentee ballots or the like, uh, strict scrutiny remains the appropriate standard for severe burdens, such as outright disqualification from voting at all. Now, you may wonder why I've told you all of this. So let me explain an irony to you. You might think that laws disenfranchising people because they've been convicted of a crime lie at the intersection of the two arguments for heightened scrutiny. Those laws deny the right to vote to individuals who are already the subject of tremendous antipathy. Arguably, these sorts of laws should get double strict scrutiny. But five years after the Supreme Court's decision in Kramer, the court flatly refused to apply that framework to laws that disenfranchise individuals who've been convicted of a crime. In Richardson against Ramirez, the Supreme Court confronted California's lifetime felon disenfranchisement ban. In other words, if you were convicted of any felony, whether you went to jail or not, uh, whether you were uh, out of jail, whether you completed your sentence, you could never vote again. And in Richardson against Ramirez, the Supreme Court held that actually the Constitution confirms affirmatively states' rights to bar individual citizens convicted of a crime from ever voting again. And the part of the Constitution they based this on is a part of the Constitution that almost never gets discussed uh, in regular constitutional law courses. It's section two of the 14th Amendment. And that provision uh, says that if a state disenfranchises any of its uh, citizens uh, for reasons other than conviction of a crime, it will lose some of its seats in Congress. Now, the irony here is that that provision was included in the amendment to deter Southern states from disenfranchising their black citizens. So here's a second irony. The Reconstruction Am Congress amended the Constitution in 1870 to add the 15th Amendment to the 14th Amendment. The 15th Amendment prohibits disenfranchising United States citizens because of their race. Now, I went back and looked at the census figures from 1870. And what did the amendment actually do uh, in, in, in kind of concrete terms? Well, it potentially promised to enfranchise somewhere roughly around 1 million black men, because that's how many black men there were in the United States over the age of 21 in 1870. And at that time, only men could vote and only individuals over the age of 21 could vote. 
So the 15th Amendment enfranchised roughly 1 million black men. But today, offender disenfranchisement laws that prohibit people with criminal convictions from voting, either when they're incarcerated, when they're on probation or parole, or for life, depending on the state, disenfranchise more black men than were enfranchised by the Constitution in 1870. And the reason I began this talk by describing the process theory that the court began to develop in the Caroline Products case is because the story of offender reenfranchisement raises an arresting question for that theory, which is one of the most influential and foundational theories in contemporary constitutional law. Efforts to gain reenfranchisement through the courts, the area where you might think process theory uh, requires the most vigilance, have been strikingly unsuccessful. The few successful attacks on, franchise, on disenfranchising laws have involved smoking gun evidence that the specific list of disenfranchising crimes that a state picked is the product of outright racism. Indeed, even outright racism is not always enough. So let me give you one example here. Mississippi had a constitutional provision that disenfranchised individuals convicted of a list of crimes. So it wasn't all felonies, it was a list of crimes. And the crimes ranged from murder at one end of the spectrum to bigamy at the other end. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals recognized that the provision had its origins in Mississippi's infamous 1890 constitution, a constitution whose central purpose according to the explanation of the Mississippi Supreme Court itself in the 1890s was, and here I'm gonna quote the Mississippi court, to obstruct the exercise of suffrage by the Negro race. So everybody recognized that the whole point of the constitution that contained this provision was to disenfranchise black people. But the Fifth Circuit held that that purposeful discrimination was not enough to doom the, the exclusion in the late 20th century because the provision had overcome its odious origin, according to the court, by reenacted, being reenacted in a process that added some crimes to the original list. And the court said, well, you know, the original list didn't have those crimes because they weren't considered black crimes. So now that you've added them, you're not a racist anymore. I mean, it's really hard to wrap your mind around that decision. And after a few interim successes, the challenges to offend, offender disenfranchisement that were brought under the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibits practices that have even an unintentionally racially discriminatory result, those cases failed as well, despite powerful evidence of the practice's disparate impact on Black communities. So uh, the courts have not been the place to go for getting rid of draconian offender disenfranchisement provisions. By contrast, we've seen real progress towards restoration within the political system. And all of that progress so far has been achieved obviously without the votes of disenfranchised offenders and former offenders because they've been disenfranchised. For example, less than six months after the Supreme Court in Richardson against Ramirez, upheld the California constitutional provision that contained a lifetime ban, California voters repealed that provision and replaced it with a provision that simply said that uh, the legislature should disqualify electors who were mentally incompetent or imprisoned or on parole for the conviction of a felony. So that meant that people would be automatically re-enfranchised uh, once they finished or eligible to, uh, to register to vote, uh, once they had finished serving their sentence or their parole term. And over the past two decades, nearly two dozen states have changed their policies to offer more opportunity for restoration. Some of the states have repealed lifetime disenfranchisement laws. Others have liberalized the procedure for individuals to recover their right to vote after, their comp after they complete their sentences. Florida's Amendment 4, to which I'll return in a moment, is only the most recent development at the state level. And there may be movement at the federal level as well. H.R. 1, which was the first bill introduced in the House of Representatives uh, after the 2018 election, would ban states from disenfranchising people in federal elections, uh, even if the people were serving, uh, uh, unless the people were still serving time in incarceration. So it turns out that reenfranchisement is only the most recent illustration of a more general point about the law of democracy. Many of the most significant gains in enfranchisement 
have been the product of what Justice Felix Frankfurter mem memorably called an aroused popular conscience that sears the conscience of the people's representatives, rather than being uh, the result of litigation or litigation alone. For example, in the five years after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, executive enforcement efforts involving federal registrars and examiners led to nearly as many black voters registering to vote in six Southern states had, as had registered in the entire century since the 15th Amendment had been ratified. Now, the recent progress on restoration challenges the conventional understanding of politics and the law of democracy in another way as well. The 21st century has seen the emergence of what Professor Dan Takaji memorably named the new vote denial. Recent years have seen the enactment of draconian voter ID laws, uh, have seen cutbacks to early voting and same-day voter registration, and to a variety of other measures that make it harder for voters to register, to cast a ballot, or to have that ballot counted. And some of these measures that restrict the right to vote have been enacted by the very states that have been easing the exclusion of former offenders. So here's a fundamental question for us. What might explain the countercyclical headway that's being made on reintegration of offenders into the political community, even as other long marginalized groups face new barriers? To drill down on this question requires us, I think, to see how offender restoration plays into what I think of as the tripartite nature of the right to vote. For me, voting embodies three nested concepts that are connected with each other. The first is participation, the ability to cast a ballot and have that ballot counted. The second is what I'll call aggregation, the ability to join with like-minded voters to achieve the election of one's preferred candidates or to achieve the adoption of one's preferred uh, policy alternatives in a referendum. And the third is governance, the ability to achieve one's preferred policies through representative decision-making. And I think the restoration movement is tied in interesting ways to all three of these. And its progress and the resistance to the progress reflects how these concepts interact. So let's start with participation. The right to vote serves a powerful expressive function regardless of election outcomes. Over our history, the franchise has been used to delineate who is and who is not a full member of the community capable of rational self-governance. Or as Justice Albie Sachs of the South African Constitutional Court said, and he is a man who not, in, not coincidentally spent quite a bit of time in prison during the apartheid era, framed the point. He wrote that the vo vote of each and every citizen is a badge of dignity and of personhood, quite literally, it says that everybody counts. On this account, the lumping of people who had been convicted of a crime with aliens, and here I'm gonna quote again, idiots, insane persons, and illiterates, uh, which was the formulation that appeared in the California Constitution at the time Abraham Ramirez filed his lawsuit, makes sense. Each of these groups of people are seen as outsiders who are otherwise unfit to take part in the process of rational governing. Moreover, offender disenfranchisement rests on the social contractarian idea that those who are going to be bound by the laws should have some say in what those laws are. The disenfranchisement of offenders on this account reflects the idea that those who fail to abide by the law have broken their side of the social contract. As Judge Henry Friendly put it, and for those of you who are law students, Judge Friendly is one of those famous and iconic uh, lower court judges um, that everybody quotes. The current Chief Justice was a law clerk to Judge Friendly and quotes him on quite a number of occasions. Probably Judge Friendly's most famous quotations though actually involve a case that those of you who've already taken contracts will remember, a case called Fragilement in which he began the uh, opinion by saying, the issue is what is chicken? Well, when Judge Friendly wrote about uh, offender disenfranchisement, he wrote, a man who breaks the law he has authorized his agent to make for his own governance could fairly have been thought to have abandoned the right to participate in further administering that compact. So voting as participation is very importantly symbolic of people's role in the community. 
I think what's broken down over the past few decades is the idea that the categorical exclusion of offenders serves any of the goals of punishment other than retribution. In Trope against Dulles, the Supreme Court held that stripping a person of his citizenship altogether, which was what was at issue in that case, violates the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. The court explained that total loss of citizenship is a form of punishment, they called it more primitive than torture, for it destroys the individual, for it destroys for the individual the political existence that was centuries in the development. But the court then contrasted loss of citizenship with loss of the right to vote. And it didn't think of disenfranchisement as punitive. Instead, it described that practice as doing nothing more than designating a reasonable ground of eligibility for voting, a non-penal exercise of the power to regulate elections. Now, no one in public discourse today defends that proposition. And here's where one aspect of governance bleeds back, if you will, into participation. Think about the recent passage at the federal level of the First Step Act or of California's realignment of its uh, correction system, or of the decriminalization of various drug-related activity in states across the country. Each of these developments reflects a growing public conviction that we're branding too many people as criminals and inflicting far too severe consequences on even those lawbreakers who do warrant some punishment. And the revitalization of the ideas of the rehabilitative and the redemptive functions of punishment. After its rejection during the 1980s in favor of retribution, deterrence, and incapacitation also feeds into the restoration movement. The rhetoric of the movement focuses on giving individuals who have paid their debt to society, and you'll notice that's expressly contractarian language, uh, the ability to reintegrate themselves, Restoration is a largely costless and heavily symbolic way to signal that re-entry. And I want to note here that the U.S. restoration movement, which focuses on this idea of having paid your debt to society, has not yet really pressed to do what Maine already does, which is to enfranchise incarcerated citizens, despite the fact that nations from Canada to South Africa to Germany to Israel do so. Now step back a moment and compare what's been going on in the restoration arena to the new vote denial. Here's a striking statistic. The share of Americans who support restoration, which is roughly two thirds of likely voters, is virtually identical to the share of likely voters who think citizens should be required to so show some form of photo identification before being permitted to cast a ballot. And the number of citizens effectively barred from voting as a result, like the number of citizens convicted of offenses that disqualify them from voting, numbers in the millions. So on the one hand, we seem to be re-enfranchising millions of people who had been disenfranchised, while we're risking the disenfranchisement effectively uh, as a de facto matter, if not as a formal matter, of millions of citizens who've been voting. What accounts for the coincident rise of voter ID laws and the decline in the severity of offender disenfranchisement provisions. One factor, I think, is surely the lack of any kind of consequentialist argument for offender disenfranchisement. We no longer think, if indeed we ever really did, that offender disenfranchisement protects against vote fraud. By contrast, the narrative of voter ID is almost entirely driven by claims, specious claims as a matter of empirics, that it somehow prevents a real risk of fraud. In addition, the narrative of personal responsibility seems to play out differently with respect to offender disenfranchisement and voter ID. It's striking that much of the recent public attention has involved challenges to state restoration procedures that place too complex or too difficult a hurdle in the path of former offenders seeking to regain their voting rights. For example, in Florida, you have to pay uh, fines and fees that were imposed but the state itself admits that it can't tell most people what level of fines and fees they still owe. By contrast, many courts and most Americans seem to think that obtaining a government issued photo ID is sufficiently easy that it's reasonable to expect every aspiring voter to get one. And it actually turns out for a number of people that this is quite difficult. They don't have their birth certificate or they are married and their married name doesn't match their birth certificate and they need the birth certificate to prove their citizenship um, or they don't have the money to pay for the documents they need to get. 
uh, or for many, many elderly African-American voters in the South, they were born at home. And so their birth certificate does, they may not have a birth certificate at all. Um, so it's not the easiest thing if you don't already have a government issued photo ID to get another one. But the most striking difference has to do with the way in which offender reenfranchisement seems to be about participation rather than about election results. That is, it's about participation, not aggregation. There's widespread bipartisan support for one form or another of offender reenfranchisement. Supporters include politicians like Lindsey Graham, Rick Santorum, Orrin Hatch, Rand Paul, and George W. Bush, along with the Koch brothers. Or look at the recent results in Florida with respect to Amendment 4. At the 2018 election where it was adopted, Republicans won both the governorship and the U.S. Senate seat by razor thin margins. And yet 65% of voters supported offender restoration. Just doing the math reveals that a significant number of Republican leaning voters must have voted for restoration. The aftermath in Florida, however, offers a powerful illustration of how the treatment of voting rights becomes more polarized once we start thinking about aggregation concerns. Offender restoration in Florida presented the prospect that more than 1.4 million Floridians could now join the voting rolls who had previously been excluded for life. Most of the social scientists who study the issue assume that turnout rates and candidate preferences among newly reenfranchised former offenders are likely to resemble the turnout rate and the candidate preferences of groups of, voter, of voters who are otherwise demographically similar. That is people with the same income level, the same age, the same race, the same education. Uh, so although 1.4 million people would become eligible to register, not all those people would register and not all of them would vote. Uh, at this point, I think about 85,000 former uh, offenders have registered to vote in Florida. Uh, and that was before the most recent round of uh, uh, registration drives and the like. But if even only a small fraction of former offenders actually vote, their votes can well swing elections in a state where margins of victory have re recently been raised, raised, raised or thin. So think back to the 2000 election in Florida, which George Bush won uh, by 535 votes, and that's what made him the president. If 86,000 new voters go onto the rolls and those voters break even marginally in favor of the de Democratic candidate rather than the Republican candidate would have changed the outcome. And politicians quite understandably assume that a gr group of voters who are disproportionately non-white as the offender population in Florida is and disproportionately low income will increase the share of votes going to Democratic candidates. So it's not surprising, even if it is depressing, that the Republican controlled Florida Supreme Court adopted a cramped construction of Amendment 4, and the Republican-dominated state legislature enacted legislation attempting to restrict Amendment 4 scope. This brings us back to the first prong of political process theory, the theory I started out talking about, the theory from Caroline Products. The concern that in John Hart Ely's words, that the ends are choking off the channels of political change to ensure that they will stay in and the outs will stay out what we might call the problem of entrenchment. That professional politicians would prefer to restrict the franchise to the electorate in front of which they had already won is entirely predictable. So the effects of disenfranchisement and restoration on electoral outcomes may turn, to be, may turn out to be most salient at the statewide level precisely because of another feature of aggregation, the creation of safe majority minority districts, something that uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 requires in areas where otherwise minority voters wouldn't be able to elect candidates of their choice. Take Florida as an example here again. In 2018, the margin of victory for the Republican candidate for governor and for senator statewide were 32,463 votes and 10,033 votes, and that's out of millions of votes cast. It's easy to see how offender reenfranchisement could reverse the direction and swamp those margins. But now look at Florida's 27 seats in the US House of Representatives. In only one of those districts was the margin of victory less than 10,000 votes. That is, you took the overall electorate, you divided it into 27 parts, 
And in all of those, and in 26 of those 27 parts, there was a greater margin of victory for the winning candidate than there was for the winning candidate statewide. Why is that so? Well, in part, it's due to geographic concentrations. In part, it's due to gerrymandering. And in part, it's due uh, to uh, the Voting Rights Act. So it may turn out that the two areas where restoration has the biggest direct electoral consequences are in statewide elections and in direct democracy, that is in referenda elections, the two aspects of the political process where other aggregation rules have the least impact. Finally, let's return to voting as governance. As I suggested earlier, the current push for offender restoration did not arise in a vacuum. Almost every public discussion of offender disenfranchisement trots out statistics about the huge increase in the number of people disenfranchised by such laws and about the staggering percentage of the African-American community that's directly excluded. For example, in 1976, shortly after the Supreme Court upheld disenfranchisement laws, about 1.7 million individuals nationwide had been stripped of the right to vote. By 2016, however, that number was estimated to be 6.1 million individuals, roughly the total population of Maryland. Those statistics tap into concerns about over-criminalization, over-incarceration, and over-policing as matters of straight-up criminal justice policy. And once support begins to grow for the idea that we criminalize too much conduct, we prosecute too many people, and we punish people too severely, we can start to look at many aspects of offender disenfranchisement with a fresh eye. Consider one of the issues that is not yet really on the table nationwide. Should incarcerated people be entitled to vote? Here it's worth your understanding that at least with respect to the United States, Maine is an outlier. Along with Vermont, it is one of only two states where individuals serving time in prison can vote. And when I've raised that issue about what should we do about currently incarcerated people with my students, and I point out that Maine and Vermont as well as many of our counterpart democracies overseas allow even prisoners to cast a ballot. I often get two responses. The first is that depriving somebody of his voting rights while he's in prison is just part and parcel of his punishment. There's a lot of stuff prison, people in prison can't do while they're locked up, and that's part of the point of locking them up. Ironically, the more important we think of the right to vote being, the more denying it to somebody is a form of real punishment and can be justified that way. But the second response rests on the United States' distinctive form of aggregation. We use geographic single member districts to elect a huge number of public offices, from school boards and city councils to state legislators, le legislatures to members of Congress. Where, my students ask, should incarcerated people vote? If they're permitted to vote where they're housed on election day, there's the possibility, particularly in local elections, that almost the entirety of particular districts would be made up of incarcerated individuals in order to satisfy the requirements of one person, one vote. For example, if prisoners have been permitted to vote for members of the Eber, Eberville Parish School Board in Louisiana, then one of the board's districts would have contained only two eligible voters who were not prisoners because that district, that parish houses a large prison. This might have two separate and troubling consequences. Either the prisoners won't vote because they have no interest in an election involving issues that concern them not at all. This would give disproportionate weight to the few free citizens in those districts relative to the voters in other districts. Or else the prisoners will vote and the votes of individuals with no tie to the community and no responsibility for paying the taxes that might go to various programs will outweigh the votes of the people who actually have to live with the consequences of representative decision making. In Maine, by contrast, incarcerated people can only vote by absentee ballot in the place where they last lived. They're not counted as residents of the town that houses a prison, which means their votes can't sway local elections, even if they all were to vote for a block. But notice something important about that solution. It rests on the implicit premise that individuals remain part of their prior communities with ongoing ties and intentions to return. Those assumptions, I want to suggest, are at least somewhat inversely correlated to the length of imprisonment. We can reasonably assume that a person serving a six-month sentence retires, retains those kinds of ties. There's no necessary difference between him 
and the fact that many of you, at least in a normal academic year, would be spending nine months in Portland, but voting back where you came from. But those assumptions might begin to break down as the prisoner starts to resemble Rip Van Winkle, absent for decades from a community that may have changed profoundly in the interim. But even here, it's worth recognizing how prisoner voting might fit into the larger ecosystem of rules governing the franchise. So one question we might ask ourselves is whether incarcerated voters differ in some salient way from overseas voters. Under a federal act called UACAVA, for example, United States citizens who are registered to vote when they lived in the United States and then move overseas can continue to vote in federal elections by absentee vote in their last place of residence so long as they're otherwise qualified to vote. Many UACAVA voters are real expats living in another country pretty much permanently. And yet we permit their sense of their continuing ties to the United States to determine whether they'll vote. This returns us then to questions of governance. In upholding New York's then existing lifetime disenfranchisement regime, against a challenge brought ironically enough by a man convicted under the Smith Act, which was an act about uh, that uh, criminalized uh, efforts to, as, as a communist to overthrow the government, uh, Judge Henry Friendly wrote that it could scarcely be deemed unreasonable for state to decide that perpetrators of serious crimes should not take part in electing the legislators who make the laws, the executives who enforce these, the prosecutors who must try them for further violations, or the judges who are to consider their cases. A contention that the Constitution requires New York to allow convicted mafiosi to vote for district attorneys or judges would not only be without merit, but as obviously so as anything can be. But here's the thing. If society comes to understand that many of the individuals who are excluded did not commit serious crimes, and that their very real arguments about whether the laws under which they were convicted should lead to incarceration or other civic disabilities, then it might come to believe that the ability to participate in changing those laws going forward is actually quite important. New York maintained for many years a savagely punitive set of drug laws, and they were maintained by a state legislature whose overall composition was in part the product of prison gerrymandering. In the 2000 round of redistricting, the last round before New York started reassigning incarcerated persons to their free world addresses after, after the census, seven of the districts in the New York State Senate, many of them represented by the state's most hard on crime legislators, met the constitutional population requirements of one person, one vote, only by including prisoners. And as for governance, one question we've only just begun to consider is to what extent changing the composition of the electorate by re-enfranchising some proportion of offenders will change criminal justice policies going forward. Or perhaps more broadly, will re-enfranchisement change policies regarding the school to prison pipeline? Or even pro more provocatively, will re-enfranchisement influence the regulation of reproductive autonomy? It's too early to tell, but 2020 may give us a first window into answering these questions. Here are just a few of the things I'll be asking. What will the uh, actual effect of offender turnout, offender reenfranchisement be on turnout? Will it affect the outcome of elections in battleground states? When we begin redistricting after the 2020 census, will reattribution of incarcerated people uh, to, in states that have adopted that policy change the composition or the makeup of state legislatures? Will arguments about procedural hurdles to reenfranchisement spill out into other areas? Will we move towards national resolution of the question of offender re restoration? And finally, will offender restoration remain a consequence of criminal justice reform or will it contribute to further reform? Those are my questions and I welcome having hearing uh, your questions now. Well, great. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, so let me ask you a question that I guess I had uh, as you were talking about the different approaches different nations take around the world. Uh, for your thoughts on what accounts for American exceptionalism here, you know, you mentioned the, the, the kind of different districting rules that may exist uh, than other places in the world. You mentioned Judge Friendly's opinion, kind of relying on this Lockean social contract theory that you've opted out of social contract. You know, I think in one of your books, you mentioned the Canadian Supreme Court, when it, it rejected this notion that you can have felon disenfranchisement laws that had this kind of veiled dig at the United States, that the fact that not all self-proclaimed democracies allow felons to vote doesn't mean we don't do it here. 
I mean, we have a kind of a different attitude towards crime and being hard on crime. What is it about the United States that leads it to a different set of rules than all those other nations that you listed? So, you know, it's a combination, I think it's a combination of things, Dimitri. You know, you've listed a number of them already, um, which is, you know, the, a lot of these nations use proportional representation systems, so it doesn't matter whether somebody is living in a prison uh, or not. Um, the United States is more punitive in general. Some of that is a legacy of race in the United States. I mean, a number of these policies were adopted um, or maintained or amended in ways that were racially aware, if not always directly racially designed. I mean, you know, the, the Supreme Court unanimously struck down uh, Alabama's m misdemeanor disenfranchisement law because there was smoking gun evidence in the 1901 Constitutional Convention, a legislator got up and said, well, here's why we've picked these crimes. We've picked these crimes because these are the crimes that we think black people commit as opposed to white people's crimes. So for example, manslaughter wasn't included, um, but uh, passing a bad check was because they thought black people passed bad checks, but they didn't, they didn't you know, uh, sort of kill each other. So some of it is race, some of it is, um, that it's hard, that some of it is this provision in the Constitution that seems to give an affirmative warrant to states doing it. Uh, some of it is politics. Um, it, I, I don't think there's one, I don't think there's one cause. I think there are many, many causes and they are aligned with other forms of American difference from other, uh, other advanced democracies. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's look at the questions here. So the one at the top here, do you think Maine and Vermont allow people who are incarcerated to vote because they're predominantly white states with a smaller portion of their incarcerated populations who are BIPOC. So to, to what extent do you think race plays a role even in the policies here in, in Maine and Vermont? Well, it, it, so it, it's a little hard to say that Maine and Vermont did this because their incarcerated populations are white as opposed to uh, they didn't have the, in, the racial incentive to disenfranchise. Um, and the Percentage of the percentage of folks who are incarcerated is much lower uh, in the New England states than than in other than in the southern states, for example, um, or than in California. Um, it, you know, they're they're smaller and more and more homogeneous states in a number in a number of important ways. But uh, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly why they're different than, for example, you could imagine. I guess like North Dakota being the same and, and it's not. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so somebody's asking here, what are the th three things that we can do as regular citizens uh, not involved in constitutional law to change voter laws to be a, a more just and fair system? You talked about how this has really become a political issue and most of the work is kind of grassroots on, on the ground. What can people do to change, to change these laws? So the biggest thing people can do is to, is to make it an issue that's salient to elected officials in states where that's the way that you change the law. That, you know, one thing to say to folks, especially um, folks who are uh, native Mainers through and through, is the process for changing laws in different states can be hugely different. So for example, in a state like California, the people can always get something on the ballot. You just have to pay uh, essentially paid uh, paid signature gatherers. If you have the money, you can get stuff on the ballot or you can do it through a grassroots campaign. In a lot of states east of the Mississippi, though, there isn't an initiative process. Um, and so it varies from state to state. But the things that people can do are, um, one thing is you can, you can work in registration drives, get people registered who are already uh, eligible. A second thing is to make sure uh, and maybe do this through uh, if you have if you have a street law class in local jails and the like in states where these folks can't vote now, uh, giving people education about how to get their rights restored. Because in a lot of states, it's uh, it's you have to go through a bunch of, of of hoops to get your rights restored, and not everybody understands how to do that. And the third is to to make this an issue that's salient to politicians, uh, so that they'll legislate to change. Uh, the laws. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question here about um, Judge Stickman's opinion in Pennsylvania. Maybe I'll use my moderator privilege to make it a little bit of a narrower question. Obviously, it's a, you know, it's a hot issue about gubernatorial powers uh, right. during COVID. Uh, 
And I, I, you know, we've seen an issue with respect to voting as well. Uh, you know, as some states try to make it easier to vote and expand voting rights. And sometimes the courts step in and say, no, you can't do that last minute changes. Uh, but also this concern that the governors or the president or somebody could use uh, emergencies or COVID to limit voting rights, limit access uh, to, to the poll. And especially as you look at kind of the courts, you know, different courts approaches, you know, Judge Stickman's opinion is, has gone the other way, but most courts using kind of the Jacobson versus Massachusetts framework have been very deferential to the governors. So do you have concerns that using, uh, maybe as a pretext, but using an emergency to limit people's right to vote uh, could happen in this upcoming election? So there's, so, you know, different governors of different states have dramatically different um, emergency powers. Um, and I, I've been doing some work that's connected with this. So uh, I, it, you know, I've seen the differences just in the state statutory provisions um, of what a governor can do by announcing an emergency. Um, you know, there's always, there's always a concern that politicians will manipulate the election rules close to an election in ways that advantage whichever party they're in and disadvantage uh, the other party. Um, and people race into both federal and state court to try and deal with that. I think there are currently 200 lawsuits pending somewhere in the United States that involve something connected with voting in the upcoming election. And on top of that, you know, if a governor, you know, the at least so far, most of the gubernatorial efforts have been executive orders designed to in make it easier for people to vote, uh, either by um, uh, ordering, uh, you know, I think one state, they had the National Guard come out to help run the polls because they didn't have enough poll workers. Poll workers tend to be uh, elderly and therefore in the, in the COVID era are, are less likely to want to show up and volunteer. Um, so if you think about what kind of executive order a governor could issue close to an election that would make it harder for people to vote, there are, you know, stay at home orders, a governor could issue a stay at home order, a governor could um, issue an order telling state workers all to stay home and some of those state workers are necessary to running the elections or the like. Um, if a governor did that, somebody would go into court almost immediately um, in both state and federal court. And so you'd see a huge amount of litigation about it. It's really hard to know what a court would do with that, um, especially for presidential elections, which have a bunch of back end time limits to them that are really uh, important. So if I could take just a minute, Dimitri, maybe and lay that out, I think it would be helpful to people. So the, president, the presidential term in office as a matter of constitutional law ends on, on noon on January 20th of the next year. Um, there are very complicated backup procedures for what happens if we haven't selected a new president by then. Um, but what that means is, you know, the electoral votes have to be counted according to the Electoral Count Act on January 6th. Uh, they have to be cast according to the Electoral Count Act on December 14th, I think it is this year. Um, and the election has to occur on the first Monday, first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So the thing that can happen if there was an emergency, say, during a mayoral election, where you could just postpone the election, you can't really postpone the election here easily. Um, you also can't have a process that takes too long to count because you have to have a winner. And so if you think back to like, for example, the, uh, I think it was the, the senatorial uh, contest between um, Al Franken and Norm Coleman, in Minnesota, they didn't figure out who won that until May. Um, and you can afford to do that with a senator because, you know, if one senator isn't there, it doesn't matter, but you can't do that with the president. So the question of what happens if you have some kind of disaster, either actual or purported, that causes a shutdown of the polls on election day is a really unplumbed area of law with regard to the presidential election. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a question I was thinking about here as well about a line between uh, the hoops to be clear for reenfranchisement, you know, paying, catching up on child support and their obligations, and poll taxes. I know there's been quite a bit of litigation sure. recently where courts have rejected those arguments. H how do you approach those? Sure. So the Fifth Circuit, I mean, the Eleventh Circuit on Bank earlier uh, this uh, er earlier this month said that 
uh, Florida's decision that you would have to pay back all restitution, all fines, and all fees before you would become eligible to vote again was not a violation of the poll tax amendment. I, I actually, I filed an amicus, I was part of an amicus effort in that case. Um, and at least with regard to the fees, we think that's clearly wrong. That fees, court fees, which go uh, in Florida as a matter of state law, either to support running the courts or they go into the general Florida treasury, are taxes. Because taxes are uh, money the government charges you in order for it to do its operations. As opposed to, for example, restitution to the victim, uh, if there's a victim of, of the crime, which isn't, I, I don't think you can really call that a tax. Um, so I, th I just think, you know, the, 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 the um, 11th Circuit divided six to four on this. And I think the four justices, four judges in the majority have the right answer here, which is if the government is charging people money uh, and that money goes to fund the operation of the government in any way, it's a tax within the meaning of the Constitution. Um, and therefore, the government can't condition your right to vote on the failure to pay that tax. There was a great article I saw just came out recently exploring whether, you know, running a court system based on fees and, and, and uh, costs raises some due process concerns for litigants who appear in front of those. Yeah, courts. well, obviously, because, you know, the, I mean, I clerked for Justice Blackman, and for the most part, I think his opinions are really great opinions, but he wrote one opinion that is just outright terrible. It's an opinion called United States Against Crass, uh, in which he, writing for the court, he the court held that if you didn't have the money to pay the filing fee to file your bankruptcy petition in federal court, you couldn't go bankrupt. Yeah. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, so we have Ambrose. Uh, how do you see textualism and originalism positively or negatively affecting progress towards reforms in post-conviction voting rights restoration? Obviously, you mentioned Richard Zemir Ramirez, you know, very textualist opinion by uh, Justice Rehnquist, I believe it was. Um, yeah, I, I think it was Justice Rehnquist. Um, so Richardson against Ramirez focuses on, uh, you know, does it does first does a kind of pure textual analysis, which is if they're going to take seats away from you in Congress for disenfranchising people, except if you're disenfranchising them for conviction of a crime, that seems to presuppose that it's not wrong to disenfranchise them for conviction of a crime, but it's wrong to disenfranchise them for any other reason. So that would be a textualist, that would be a pretty textualist argument. It's not just text, it's also um, a kind of canon of inferencing uh, that's sometimes called, you know, inclusio unius, exclusio alterius, or maybe it's the other way around, which is basically if we say you can't do this and this and this, implicitly we're saying you can do the stuff we don't tell you not to do. Um, so that's, that's, the, that, that's the textless argument. The originalist argument is actually at the time that Congress adopted the 14th Amendment and adopted the 15th Amendment, lots of states did disenfranchise people. There's some disagreement about exactly when the disenfranchising provisions came in, but there were a lot of states that disenfranchised people, including some states that were readmitted uh, after the Civil War. And so Congress presumably thought their constitutions were just fine and consistent. So that's a kind of originalist argument. Um, and then there's, of course, I think the argument that's most likely to sway the court here, which is not either the textual argument standing alone or the originalist argument uh, standing alone, um, but the uh, argument from precedent, which is the Supreme Court clearly held that you can do this and nothing has changed that should lead us to revisit uh, that constitutional question. Okay, great. Well, one last question here. Um... Would Professor Carlin perhaps be willing to comment on what her greatest concerns are surrounding the upcoming 2020 presidential elections? You know, don't give us nightmares, but uh, yeah. what, are, what are some of your, your biggest concerns? So um, uh, I actually just did a piece in the New York Review of Books, which people can look at that lays out stuff in more detail. It's a, of a, it's a review of a book called Will He Go? Um, and that title tells you what the, that author's major concern is. Um, I think there are three concerns and possibly four. The first is that confusion about what people's rights are and confusion about what's gonna happen at the polls and confusion about uh, eligibility to apply for and get a, 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 a vote by mail ballot or early voting may depress turnout. And it may depress turnout differentially among different groups of people. So that's 
concern number one. Uh, concern number two uh, is that uh, on election day, uh, things will go wrong in some way or another. Concern number three is that because we have a huge, huge upsurge in the number of people who are going to be voting by mail, and vote by mail ballots require a kind of processing that vote voting at the polls ballots don't require, that uh, if the election is very close, there will be places that will not be able to announce the results for two or three days after the election. And people in America are used to kind of like immediate election gratification for the most part, right? You know, uh, I remember when I first moved to California, uh, Barbara Freed, whom Dimitri knows, was giving an election night party. And I said, well, what time does the party start? And she said, well, it starts at 5 p.m. because that's when they start announcing who won the states in the East. Well, you know, it, it, we may not know all of those things on election day. Um, and what that is likely to do is lead to anxiety because the president and the attorney general have been suggesting that there will be massive amounts of fraud in the election. I don't actually think there will be massive amounts of fraud. But the thing that really keeps me up is that people will lose confidence in the idea that the American election system is a legitimate system that actually reflects the will of the voters and that that will carry on past whatever happens in the election of 2020. Great. Well, thank you so much, Pam. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Hope you're well, staying thank you all for Thank you all for having me. I actually, you know, I would have tried to fly to Maine uh, to do Constitution Day anyway, but it, it, it is a pleasure to be able to do it uh, from my house and, and then go and teach my class this afternoon. Well, it is very nice here today. And I think you know, our air is, is better at this point. So hopefully you're staying healthy and safe out last. Yep, better, better air today. It's not bright orange outside. I, if I had had to do this like four or five days ago, the, the window in front of me that's giving the light that I'm using uh, would have been, I, I would have looked like something on Mars, so. Scary. Well, all right, thank you again. Great. Bye everyone. Bye.